Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first in this semester's research group on Constitutional Studies lecture series. The RGCS lecture series is supported by a generous gift to McGill from the Aurea Foundation and brings leading scholars from the social sciences, philosophy, and law to McGill, inviting them to present leading research on the values, institutions, and principles of a free society in a way that brings contested questions about those structures of a free society to the attention of student life in a way that is accessible to a broad student audience. RGCS is a research unit of McGill that brings together faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and an undergraduate fellowship from across political theory and political science, political philosophy and the philosophy of law, constitutional law, public law, um, and more broadly, again, from across the humanistic parts of the social sciences, including political science, about the institutions of constitutional government and a free society. Uh, this lecture series will continue. The next event in it will be the end of academic year debate on March 31st between Cecile Fabre of Oxford University and Eric Mack of Tulane University uh, debating the nature and principles of ownership and property. And that debate will be at this time at 4.30 p.m. in Thompson House. RGCS is a part of the newly established Jan P. Lin Center for the Study of Freedom and Global Orders in the Ancient and Modern Worlds. The Lin Center brings together normative and historical social inquiry from across the university, broadly speaking encompassing the social sciences and history within the Faculty of Arts, but also allied fields in law and in architecture in the Faculty of Engineering, aiming to encourage interdisciplinary conversations about social inquiry that draws on the social sciences as well as on normative and historical modes of inquiry. The Jan P. Lin Center is newly established this year by a gift to McGill from Jan P. Lin, PhD, class of 1992, and it will have its formal opening in an inaugural lecture on April 13th to be given by Orlando Patterson, a leading historical sociologist in the world coming to us from Harvard. For today, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome to McGill Jenna Bednar, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Michigan. Professor Bednar is, in my informed judgment, um, one of the very finest political scientists in the world of our generation and the very finest political scientist in the world who studies federalism as a major topic. She is committed to methodologically rich and complicated kinds of studies of political institutions. And she has really established herself as someone who can engage, on the one hand, in comparative institutional analysis that requires her to know and to be able to communicate about the shape of institutions in different societies around the world. And on the other hand, someone who is able to approach those using the tools provided by advanced computational analysis and the analysis of complex systems. In work on complex systems that requires working at multiple levels simultaneously, thinking about how individuals behave toward one another against the background of one set of rules or another, and how institutions coalesce, relate to one another, relate to the individuals that are within them, again, against the background of one set of rules or another. That study of complexity theory is still relatively new to all of political science. And Professor Badnar has been one of the leaders in making it uh, understandable and comprehensible as an option from within the study of comparative politics and comparative political institutions. Uh, the leading site in the world for the study of complexity theory and complex analysis of institutions is the Santa Fe Institute, where she is an external faculty member. She is also a research associate professor at the Center for Political Studies in the Institute for Social Research, uh, 
at the University of Michigan, one of the world's leading sites for behavioral political science. She has been visiting research professor at INSEAD at Fontainebleau, uh, W. Glenn Campbell and Rita Ricardo Campbell National Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and visiting professor at the University of Michigan Law School and the University of Southern California Law Center. She is the author of many articles covering a range of topics not limited to federalism, but broadly speaking encompassing those in which she can make a contribution drawing on this kind of analysis of complex systems and institutional and individual behavior and incentives uh, using those tools, but also putting what she's able to learn in those contexts into conversation with other areas of political science, including notably for our purposes with political theory. And she is also the author of one of the very best books on federalism published in recent decades, The Robust Federation. Please join me in welcoming Jenna Bednar. Hi, I am delighted uh, to see you all here, and I'm so grateful for you all for coming out. And I have some advice for you right from the start. Whatever you thought you wanted to do with your life, I have a new goal for you. The new goal should be do whatever it takes to get Jacob Lovely to, to introduce you. Uh, so that I am positive was the kindest uh, introduction I've ever received. And just know no one could live up to that, including me. So uh, there we are. Um, I uh, am so thrilled for another reason, to be here and have this opportunity to talk about federalism uh, with you here in Montreal. Um, and that's because my love of federalism started here, in your library. Uh, the, uh, so when I, well actually, okay, I take that back, not here. <laughs> It started in Ottawa, a very quick bio story that wasn't in this introduction. I was, uh, although I'm now a professor at University of Michigan, I was an undergraduate there as well. And the University of Michigan has a really unusual opportunity for its undergraduates to serve as uh, legislative assistant interns in your House of Commons. And so I took advantage of that opportunity um, and went and I was an intern for Andrew Roulette uh, from Montreal. And uh, I, I know some of you are sniggering, good reasons, but we'll get into that during the reception if you like. Um, the, uh, and I came to Ottawa as an American uh, not in any sense understanding what federalism was. Because, yeah, I mean, we had, we have federalism in the United States, but it was basically dead. So I come here and find that it's completely alive. And, you know, 1990. Quick, what's going on in Canada in 1990? Oh, God. Excellent. Not what I thought would be the first thing. Oh, of course, here we are in Montreal. You would say Oka. Um, what else? Uh, it was two years later. Close. What else? Meech Lake failed. Meech Lake failed, right? Uh, anyway, um, there was a long series of exciting things. Uh, there was a controversial abortion vote. There's, uh, we can go into it during the reception. I'm happy to, always happy to relive those days. But I went back to the States, and I'm like, that's it. i got to understand federalism better. Go off to grad school, uh, and I'm at the opening reception for the graduate students, and uh, the guy I thought might become my advisor is like, you want to study federalism? I'm not sure there's a more boring topic than federalism. But thank God he was so wrong. And so that's what I want to talk about with you today, is that the Americans have finally caught up with the Canadians and figured out just how exciting federalism is and how it can be used as an instrument to really shape policy and rights. So um, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> 
little thesis. Uh, what I want you to be thinking about through this talk today is that federalism is evolving. It's very much alive. We're only going to talk about the U.S. I'm done talking about Canada. Um, uh, it's, it's very much evolving. And when I say it's evolving, what I'm talking about is this distribution of authority between the federal or the national level of government and the states. The understanding of what each is able to do, perhaps exclusively, perhaps with a shared power. And the way it's evolving is increasingly toward empowering the states. And that's leading to a lot of diversity and expression, um, as well as pushing from below back up to shape national policy. And part of the way that this happens uh, is because our, those boundaries of federalism are not shaped exclusively by the Supreme Court, which is what I thought was true when I, uh, uh, back in the day. But as I started learning much more about federalism, I see that it's a product this interpretation of where there's boundaries of, the, of authority lie is a product of multiple safeguards interacting with one another, pushing against one another's interpretations, and also of the agents themselves, the federal government and the states, interpreting for themselves what they're allowed to do. So I'm going to give you a little picture of that. Most of what we're going to talk about, uh, I'll give you a, a quick overview of some of the changes in authority and rights that we're seeing, then uh, I'm going to talk a lot about the evolution of federalism doctrine in the United States context. But as I share this, and since we're talking about doctrine, you might think, oh, she's only going to talk about the Supreme Court. But I want you to be thinking about the court as having its ears open and listening to a public. And that will become increasingly clear toward the end of, uh, of the hour. And I'll talk briefly at the end about some implications, in, including uh, opportunities for uh, more conservative policies to rise to the fore, which didn't exist uh, uh, earlier when, when po um, policies were more centralized. Okay. So, uh, so uh, just a few. Uh, there are so many ways that things have changed. Um, but I'm going to talk about some new authorities, including something that really excites my undergraduates, marijuana legalization. Uh, uh, and then um, also uh, new ways that the states are feeling themselves empowered to push back against federal legislation. So just starting with marijuana laws, uh, we see across the states um, uh, according to this map, which is put out, oh, you can't see it because of the table, but by an organization that has been lobbying for a very long time for marijuana legalization, and so they're very thrilled to, to uh, publish this map. I love maps, so you're going to see a lot of maps, um, that uh, shows differences in the status of uh, marijuana use across the country. A couple of states were, uh, the deep green, for, uh, where it's, it's uh, legal, um, and then sh various shades of green elsewhere. Uh, the thing about this, though, is that it remains illegal in every state. Right? So because it's still illegal according to federal law. But the states, the people within states, have said the federal government shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't be regulating my recreational use of a substance that has no, does no harm to others. This is, you know, the, the call. And so uh, increasingly effective pushback, including now in three states and Washington, D.C., where it, it, the possession of marijuana is, un, there are no state laws against it. And the federal government has stood back, initially saying that they would pursue those who uh, possess or use uh, marijuana, including for, mar for uh, medical use, now have stepped back and said, well, let's see what happens. So this is a change that was pushed by the states. Um, other things, there's been no change whatsoever in the ability of uh, um, 
the federal government to regulate the environment and definitely no change in their willingness to regulate uh, um, and preserve environmental quality. But the EPA let, has uh, sets terms for environmental regulation and then has the enforcement down at the state level. So it's the state departments of environmental quality who are uh, in charge of enforcing federal law. When you decentralize that enforcement, you get a lot of variation. As we have learned very sadly in the state of Michigan, because I'm sure you've heard about the Flint uh, water crisis, and that is a failure at the state level in enforcing federal laws. But so here's just a, a map of uh, um, reported noncompliance uh, with environmental regulation, and then I can show you other maps where, that uh, talk about the uh, state uh, uh, DEQs not pursuing these reported noncompliances. Um, that's interesting because they're setting policy according to their own priorities. Weighing, of course, environmental regulation bumps up very often against economic activities. And so if the priority is toward economic activities, then you would want to suppress the enforcement of environmental regulation. This one I want to spend a moment on. So the, I'm sure you've heard over the last few years, we've had uh, a significant uh, uh, the uh, uh, domestic uh, achievement by the Obama administration is the expansion of health insurance to individuals and what I want to focus on uh, to uh, the expansion and access by our very poor to um, a program called Medicaid, which is a program uh, financed jointly between the federal and the state governments that uh, offers health insurance to those who are extremely poor. But the way that Medicaid had been run prior to the Affordable Care Act was that although it's jointly financed between the federal and state governments, state governments could choose how poor you have to be in order to qualify for Medicaid. So as a consequence of states having that authority, some states said, well, like Minnesota uh, said, uh, you know, for a family of four, as long as you're making under, say, about $45,000, you are poor enough to qualify for this government-provided health insurance. Whereas other states, uh, Arkansas, um, for example, down here, uh, is uh, uh, had, let me see if I can remember this correctly, uh, for if you were an individual, if you were an individual, you couldn't have access. A family of four was no longer eligible for Medicaid, the adults in the family anyway, if they made more than $2,000 a year. <clears throat> so that's a surprisingly small amount of money um, uh, to cause someone to be made ineligible. Part of the Affordable Care Act said that in order for states to continue receiving the federal subsidies uh, for the Medicaid program, they needed to raise the eligibility rates to a certain level, much closer to what Minnesota had. And uh, the states pushed back. They said, you can't do that. Uh, and one, I'm going to uh, give you a little more detail on this, but won their suit in a, in a suit that surprised all of us uh, as constitutional observers of what the Supreme Court was uh, going to decide regarding to the Affordable Care Act. We all expected, um, based upon precedent, for the, um, the court to side with the federal government. And instead, they sided with the states, saying that the states could not, uh, it was still going to be up to the states to whether or not to expand uh, access. So long lead up to what the heck is going on in this picture. So you see states, you see darker colors. Does this show up? Yeah. Darker colors are um, percentage of the population who is uninsured. Okay. So you have some states. Up in the north, this is not really showing up, 
up in the north, uh, where basically everybody has access to health insurance and other states that don't. And the other thing to notice about this is some states are outlined in black. Those that are outlined in black did decide to expand access to uh, Medicaid. You see an enormous effect of that, uh, in particular Arkansas, by uh, the one I was picking the bone with, was, uh, did decide, after all, to expand from like $2,000 all the way up to now, um, it's over 30000 25000 uh, before you get cut off. And you see Arkansas looks very different from all the states around it. Uh, so expression, though, this is, a, this is states retaining a power by pushing back against a federal government's attempt to uh, impose a policy that we had thought they were able to impose. So this is a new power that the states have. Um, others, uh, things having to do with uh, federal government uh, making changes to education policy, and this is just another graphic showing states pushing back first against uh, Pre President Bush's signature domestic um, act, which was the No Child Left Behind Act, and states uh, pushing back against that, not wanting that, and now against the Obama administration's attempts at education reform called the Common Core, again, pushing back. Uh, so other things have happened in the, uh, and uh, which aren't directly related to federalism, except that they came out because of federalism. So individual rights have changed and been shaped by these dynamics between the uh, federal and the state government. So changing uh, individual rights in gay marriage and in gun ownership. First in gay marriage, what you see here is I love this. Remember, I like maps, and so I love this. Uh, but what you see are uh, maps of the United States starting from 2001. This room is l gorgeous, by the way, because none of you are too far away, I think. Uh, so you can all, I hope, make out the, the dates. Yeah, awesome. 2001 all the way to June 2015. What happened in June 2015? Why is that uh, the time when... The, uh, there's a massive switch in map if we're talking about gay marriage. Anyone follow it? Yeah. You, you, you guys can say it together because you... And what was that? Awesome. All right. So as of June 2015, the Supreme Court has recognized the right of couples of the same sex to be married in all of the states. So one might say, ah, the court is creating that. But instead, what we're seeing here, and I'll show you in a little bit more detail later, is that there was an awful lot of lead up to that. Right? And that lead up was happening in the states. The states, first through, uh, first by saying, oh, God help us, no way do we want to go in that direction. So the first thing they did was start, uh, so what we're seeing, whether it's banned or legalized, uh, yellow is banned and uh, blue is legalized. So initially, the moves are toward banning, right? And there are two different ways of banning it, whether the, the, it was done uh, through legislation or whether it was done through some uh, people-initiated amendment to the state constitution. Um, but so we see, starting in 2001, and uh, uh, this is... Uh, uh, a movement in the states toward banning it, and then there's a little state that pops up blue. Does anyone know in the states who moved first, or are you really good with your U.S. geography and, and no? Yeah. It wasn't. Uh, so, uh, the first one that's dark blue Massachusetts, pretty close to Vermont, all right? But Vermont was an early mover as well. But Massachusetts, uh, first one to make it legal. And then people in other states are like, wait a minute, they're going to get all the tourism dollars from all those wealthy gay couples are going to go there and have their weddings. So, uh, so we see Massachusetts standing on its own for a while, and then, then we get 
Vermont, we get Iowa in 2009, uh, done uh, judicially, and then more states. It's percolating, right? So things are changing. I'll track this again a little bit later in the lecture, but we see a lot of changes, a lot of experimentation at the state level before the court feels comfortable making this decision. So this is an individual right that really is there because of the states. Uh, another um, change in rights is a new interpretation of our Second Amendment, which, uh, is, which I'll talk about more in a couple minutes. But there's differences across the state still in different regulations of uh, what kinds of guns you can own and how um, difficult it is to purchase one, and whether they're background checks, et cetera. And those differences end up being quite important. This is a study that uh, someone did recently tracking guns that were used in crimes and where those guns came from. And what's really interesting is that he found that there was a flow from states that have pretty unrestricted access to guns into states with higher uh, uh, restrictions on guns. So there are these externalities that are generated because of these differences. Uh, externalities, whenever we're celebrating the ability of states, as we should, the ability of states to set policy according to what their publics want, we also need to bear in mind the possibility of externalities. Now, I joked about some externalities with gay marriage earlier, all those tourism dollars going somewhere else, but there's not as much of a case to be made for externalities with gay marriage. There is a case to be made here with uh, um, uh, regulation of firearms. Okay, so let's step back. Let's put our con law scholar hats on. Uh, and I, I just asked Jacob how, you know, have you guys all had courses in constitutional law? And he reassured me, no, because <laughs> otherwise you might find this a, like a, a little review. But we're going to go through and trace some changes in federalism doctrine. Looking at the U.S. Constitution, there are a couple of clauses that we zero in on as key clauses in understanding how centralization of policy occurs, and we want to look at changes to the interpretation of those policies. Okay. Uh, so there, there was a long period where the U.S. Federation was becoming increasingly centralized, and as I said, as you know, I, when I. Um, uh, when we, ta we um, started talking uh, that uh, you guys were way ahead of us in terms of realizing how exciting federalism can be. Um, but the first era when uh, federalism really came to the fore and people were talking about it a lot uh, was thanks to this guy. Um, so Richard Nixon, uh, in one of his happier days, um, but he had uh, he had some idea that the states and the cities were uh, underused in their potential and their capacity to may be creative as generators of policy. So there was a sense of a new federalism. Right? Uh, it took a while to catch on. First time we see it in the courts is a case called the National League of Citry, Cities v. Usury from 1976. So this was a, a case that was uh, uh, questioning uh, a federal law that was regulating workplace uh, rules um, and whether or not that could be applied to state and municipal employees. So it's one thing for the federal government to regulate the private sector, but can it also regulate the states and their employees? Uh, and this 
law or this application of the law to uh, state employees was struck by the court. Uh, first important time in a long while that the uh, court had, not, had told Congress no. And they did it based upon a read of our Tenth Amendment, which is a um, reserved powers. So they, their reasoning made it uh, was, was like, I like to think of it as old school federalism, right? Like there, there's the federal government and there's the states, and uh, it's like a mar, you know, it's like a, a layered cake. Federal government does certain things, the states do certain things, but what was important about it for us as students of federalism is that they recognized the significance of the states to our union. And so they said that uh, they're essential to the union and so Congress can't uh, undermine the state's independent, separate and independent existence. Now, that was neat. Uh, nobody knew what to do with it. Uh, like, how do you interpret that? How do you know if their existence is being threatened? Uh, and so they kind of went back and forth a lot. Uh, um, and in 1985, they kind of threw up their hands and said, we have no idea how to, how to interpret this. Um, and said uh, that basically, yeah, the states are important, but they're protected by uh, the way the government's structured and by the political process. So there isn't a remedy or protection for them to be found in the courts. Which of course left everyone of course, scratching their heads. Um, and so from there, there was a, what I, the very first article I ever wrote we, uh, with a um, con law scholar, Bill Eskridge, uh, we called the court's unsteady path. And we laid out a theory of federalism that, uh, um, well, I, I laid out the theory of federalism and then Bill, who was brilliant at constitutional law, turned it into something that made sense to constitutional lawyers and uh, scholars. And uh, we wrote it in the 93, 94, and then we were due to present it, my first presentation ever, 1995, um, on the day that the court announced its decision in a case called U.S. v. Lopez. And I'm like completely nervous because we made a prediction. And thank God the court agreed with us, right? So, because otherwise it would have been a really embarrassing presentation. Um, so uh, this is a case about um, a student named Lopez who wasn't, didn't have the greatest judgment. So Lopez went to this school in San Antonio. This is the football team he played on. And this is the gun he brought to school one day. Or this is the kind of gun he brought to school one day. <laughs> uh, so he, he had the great idea that he would like take this gun that was sitting around the house at home and impress his friends. So he brought it to school in his backpack. And someone's like, you know, Lopez has a gun in his backpack. And uh, you know, by second hour, he was already in handcuffs. So, um, the, not a great idea, but the, um, the, the, he was charged not under Texas law, which said you can't take guns to school, but under a federal law called the Gun Free School Zones Act of 1990. So the federal government had created these kind of islands around schools within, I think, a thousand feet of schools. You couldn't have uh, a weapon in, the, in that area. <clears throat> and, uh, and so by being charged under this federal uh, 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 law, it meant that, he, that his very smart lawyers uh, could say, hmm, okay, yeah, he had the gun. But that law shouldn't have existed. And that law shouldn't have existed because Congress exceeded its constitutional authority. That's a good lawyer, right? Literally with the smoking gun in his hand. And, no, he didn't fire it. But, but uh, you know, okay, sure, he did it. But he did something that shouldn't have been illegal. <laughs> 
Um, so the question was, does Congress have the constitutional authority to make it illegal to have a gun in this area around a school? That's a question of authority assignment. Uh, and if there should be, you know, there's a question of whether or not there ought to be a law, and if so, which level of government can, ha can make that law? Now, the question of whether or not Congress should have that right means that Congress, it's on Congress to point to a spot in the Constitution that says, yeah, you can go ahead and ban possession of weapons around schools. Well, I don't know how many of you have read your Constitution, your U.S. Constitution, uh, but it's even shorter than the Canadian Constitution, and there isn't actually a line in there that says anything about the core, the Congress, and guns around schools. Um, but Congress did what it always did. It pointed to its very favorite clause, which was the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause says, the United States Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Clearly enabling Congress to restrict possession of firearms within schools. Congress was sure that they were going to be fine by pointing to this clause because every time they pointed to this clause, the court had said, okay, that seems right. It's called the Elastic Commerce Clause for good reason. It had been stretched so many times to cover so many different domains. So initially extended from straight up commerce, like trade between people, right, to navigation, because if you're gonna buy stuff, it's gotta get there somehow. Um, and rivers were the way to do it. Then to labor, because someone's got to build the stuff, right? Um, then to discrimination. Uh, and then, one of my favorites, an in-state recreation area where they were selling, uh, uh, you know, employing people from the state, and it's a state park. Nobody but people in the immediate area even knew this thing existed. But they had Snickers bars at the snack bar. And so those Snickers bars were not made in that state. They were selling products made from another state. Therefore, of course, it's interstate commerce, right? So this made some people wonder, was there any limit to what Congress could do as long as it could point to the Commerce Clause, as long as there was some kind of economic effect, right? So the legal questions here is Lopez's stupid action related to commerce. Um, does it substantially affect commercial activity? Um, and the holding was that this law was struck, right? So this is why Bill and I were like, thank God for Rehnquist. Uh, so here's what uh, uh, Rehnquist, who was our chief justice at the time, here's what he said. And I, I'm going to quote it in full because it's just, you know, this is such a moment. To uphold the, so here, first, what the government claimed was that it definitely affects commerce because why do people go to school? To, well, to be on the football team, but to learn stuff right? And they want to learn stuff so they can get jobs. And if they don't learn stuff, then they're not going to get a good job or they're going to do a bad job at their job and it's going to affect the economy. So that's Congress's reasoning, okay? So what Rehnquist said is, give me a break. To uphold the government's contentions here, we have to pile inference upon inference in a manner that would bid fair to convert congressional authority under the Commerce Clause to a general police power of the sort retained by the states. Admittedly, some of our prior cases have taken long steps down that road, giving great deference to congressional action. The broad language in these opinions has suggested the possibility of additional expansion but we decline here to proceed any further. 
To do so would require us to conclude that the Constitution's enumeration of powers does not presuppose something not enumerated. That's terrible. Don't ever write like that. Okay. Uh, double negatives. And that there will never be a distinction between what is truly national and what is truly local. This we are unwilling to do. Okay, apart from the muckiness down here where it turns green and all the negatives show up, what he's saying is the buck stops here, we've had enough. Right? At some point, federalism is meaningful. And today's the day that starts. Okay. So we shouldn't forget that it's not just the federal government that needs to be reined in, that can cause problems within the federal union. The states are perfectly capable of messing things up within the union as well. So staying on this same question of uh, possession of firearms gives us an opportunity to think about some things that the states have been doing and the uh, new interpretation of the Second Amendment. So uh, here's another question of authority assignment. Should handgun possession be regulated at all? Right? Before we were just talking about it around schools and by the federal government. But what about just if you want to have a gun? Can the government say anything about that? Uh, and if so, should the federal government be able to regulate it? This ability on the part of the federal government to regulate it to the point of making it impossible to own a firearm was uh, eliminated in a decision known as Heller in 2008, but it applied only to Washington, D.C., where the, um, because the, the case was about an issue within uh, Washington, D.C. law, and in the United States, I don't know if you knew this, but Washington, D.C. is considered a jurisdiction of no state, but instead directly of the federal government. So in saying that the Second Amendment, our interpretation of the Second Amendment, um, uh, means that the federal government can't make it impossible to own a handgun, the question was, what about the states? And so uh, very soon after the Heller decision, there was a challenge to a uh, law in the city of Chicago that uh, regulated uh, possession of handguns in Chicago. And this was the plaintiff in, um, in that case, Otis McDonald. And uh, Mr. McDonald wanted to have a gun, keep a gun at home um, to protect his family. And that his desire to do this was uh, not, uh, was illegal under the, the cities of Chicago's regulations at the time. So although it was already illegal for the federal government to make it, or it was unconstitutional for the federal government to make the possession illegal, the question was still open about whether or not the states could ban handguns. Um, so we have a, a process called selective incorporation. As rights are read into the Constitution, uh, they initially generally apply to the federal government and then need, the court needs to say, oh, and it also applies to the states. So that thing that we said that the federal government can't do, they also need to say that the states can't do it. So this is what happened in that McDonald decision. Uh, the court incorporated its interpretation of the Second Amendment. And out, the outright ban on handguns is prohibited. Um, they did leave open the question of other firearms being regulated, which we'll get to in a second. So here is uh, Judge uh, uh, Justice Alito writing the opinion in that case, but he's largely quoting from that Heller decision earlier that self-defense is a basic right, um, and uh, this notion of self-defense is what they saw as the core principle expressed in a uh, grammatically challenging uh, amendment. For those of you who have read the Second Amendment, it's incredibly confusing. Um, but so they said it's essentially about uh, private safety. And most people 
who choose to keep firearms for personal protection choose handguns. So therefore, you can't make it impossible for otherwise law-abiding citizens to have a handgun. So, so does that put the states and municipalities out of the regulatory picture? We have this new interpretation of the Second Amendment, and we have uh, an increasingly, uh, well, you know, it's horrible, like some of the things that have been happening, right, with the mass shootings. And so there's a lot of controversy in the U.S. over, hmm, what's the answer, more guns or fewer guns? Nobody really knows the answer. And when we don't really know the answer, this is when federalism can be exceptionally useful because we can experiment. But we can only experiment if the states and municipalities can try different things. So the question is, in this post-Heller, McDonald world, this new interpretation of the Second Amendment, do states and municipalities still have the latitude that they need in order to experiment with different um, ways of regulating firearms to see what works? Right? And the answer, and this just came six weeks ago, is yes. So here, um, this guy, uh, Ari Friedman, he's a pediatrician in Highland Park, Illinois. And he's the plaintiff, the chief plaintiff, in a, uh, a lawsuit brought against the city of Highland Park. Highland Park is a swank suburb of Chicago sitting just uh, north um, of the city of Chicago on Lake Michigan. And uh, he, uh, the city of Highland Park banned the possession of assault weapons. They can't ban handguns. But the decision left open this question of other kinds of firearms. And so Highland Park has banned the possession of assault weapons. And Ari Friedman says, the millions of Americans who use such assault weapons use them for the same lawful purposes as any other type of lawful firearm, hunting, recreational shooting, and self-defense. So uh, he was really peeved about a decision I'll tell you about in just a second and is now running for state senate to do something about it. But um, in December 2015, just a few weeks ago, the uh, uh, Supreme Court decided to let this law stand they didn't, by denying um, the hearing of it, denying cert. The, uh, so because when the U.S. Supreme Court denies cert, they don't give reasons necessarily, we do have reasons given at the appellate level for this. And this is from Frank Easterbrook, who um, is a, a longtime lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School and also a judge on the U U.S. Court of Appeals. And um, he advised deference to city and state officials who seek to protect public safety. And he said, assault weapons with large capacity magazines can fire more shots faster and thus be more dangerous in the aggregate. Why else are they the weapons of choice in mass shootings? So he said, this is an important public safety issue. We should let the states and municipal governments experiment with regulation. So we get this diverse regulatory picture that remains even in this post-Heller, uh, uh, post post-McDonald interpretive world of the Second Amendment where there, the uh, uh, foundational principle was established that people could possess a handgun, but still we can have a lot of diversity across states and municipalities in terms of other methods of regulation. So other things, so that's, you know, kind of, I, I moved away from the Commerce Clause a bit there and into the Second Amendment. But there, another big issue for the states is their fiscal autonomy. So, and to talk about this, I'm going to talk about it through two laws. Uh, one, uh, an interpretation of a constitutional clause again, the spending powers, actually a power to tax, implying the spending powers. Um, and then uh, Unfunded Mandate Reform Act, uh, 
um, that was passed uh, as part of the Republican Revolution of Congress in the mid-1990s. So first, in the United States, the thing that you should realize is that the states first are important fiscal entities. They spend an awful lot of the money that is spent uh, in domestic spending in, um, in terms of uh, policy provision in the United States. And second, that the money that they spend, a lot of it comes from the federal government. So uh, a quarter to a third of the money that states have to spend is a, a transfer from the federal government. So states are very dependent on the federal government for money. And uh, actually, you see better than the last graphic, just changes in uh, uh, state spending but here you see, even as the, um, the total amount that they're spending changes, the amount in yellow are transfers from the federal government. So it's a significant amount of money, and they need it. Um, so as, the, uh, as, the con as Congress's access to the Commerce Clause to justify its actions, as that was shut down by the Rehnquist Court, the same moment, the Rehnquist Court um, made it all the more possible for them to use their second most favorite clause within the Constitution, um, which was, as I said, the Taxing Clause, which implies the power to spend. So that is, the federal government has the power to tax. If they want to spend it, they can spend it as they see fit. If that spending means transferring to the state governments, they can attach strings on that spending and tell the state governments how to spend that money, put conditions on how the states spend that money. So the states, uh, you know, they're taking this money, they need the money, but as, uh, as, the, as Congress is um, attaching increasingly obscure strings to those transfers, the states at some point had had enough. And so in the mid-80s, they said, wait a minute. Federal government was sending down money for highway maintenance. And they said, oh, by the way, if you want all your money, you've got to raise the minimum drinking age. No more of these, like, 18 and 19-year-olds having a beer. So uh, if the states wanted their highway spending, then they had to raise the uh, minimum drinking age to 21. So you would think Rehnquist, Rehnquist, right? You would think he would roll his eyes. But instead, Rehnquist is like, oh, that's a good question. Is that going too far? Well, I tell you what we'll do. We'll have a four-pronged test. And we'll use this test to decide whether Congress has gone a step too far in its attachment of these strings on these transfers. And so this is a case. The, the Dole here is Libby Dole, who is Secretary of Transportation at the time. He said, OK, first, it's got to be in the general welfare. Right, so you know your POG clause? We've got the equivalent, which is the general welfare clause. It's got to be in the general welfare. Second, there's got to be a clear statement somewhere in that string that you're attaching that you intend to attach that string, that there are consequences. Third, those conditions have to be related to the federal interest. And fourth, you can't ask the states to do something that's unconstitutional. What do you think about this test? So here, this is how we're going to decide if Congress has gone too far, ever. Well, who decides who's in the, what's in the general welfare? Possibly the closest we have as an expression of general will is Congress, right? Not a great one, but so if Congress says it's okay, then it must be okay. <laughs> 
That's rule number one. Rule number two, clear statement rule. All right, you got to tell them that you intend to do this. Rule number three, it has to be related to the federal interest. See rule number one. Rule number four, you can't require something uh, that they do something unconstitutional. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is ridiculous. This is not a test. Well, it's a test, but it's a silly one, right? Anything Congress wants to do, it can do. Any string it wants to attach, it can attach. The state's like, thanks. We thought you were on our side, and then they came up, he came up with this. So Congress thrilled, you know, getting to work. Who cares about that Commerce Clause? We've got spending powers until this guy came. All right. So this was what I said earlier was the decision that totally shocked us. Jacob, were you shocked? Yes. Yes. We were shocked. There were two things that the court, okay, what is this about? This is the Affordable Care Act. This is the court deciding whether or not what Congress had done with the Affordable Care Act was constitutional. Long story, grossly simplified, there were two big questions. Can Congress require people to purchase insurance? That's the individual mandate part of it. And second, can they require the states to uh, expand Medicaid eligibility? Right. The individual mandate was the thing that got everybody all flustered because, you know, can, does the government have the authority to force people to purchase something? That's what we thought was really difficult. There was precedent, but it was, you know, going back to the Depression era, and it was a, it was a decision that everybody hated. Uh, I'm talking about Wickard here. Um, and so we were all like, oh, Roberts is going to finally do something about Wickard. Uh, and we thought for sure the Medicaid eligibility expansion was going to stand because thanks to Rehnquist, we had that stupid four-prong test, right? Uh, so, but Roberts first says there's nothing wrong with the individual mandate. Okay. Uh, second, that whole forcing the states to expand eligibility so the poor people can be insured? You can't make them do that. We're like, what? We're like, since when? Of course they can. Uh, and he says, you know, because this is a program that was already, this is a deal you'd already struck. You can't change the terms of the deal. We're like, wait a minute, Rehnquist never said anything about that. That's not, do we have a five-prong test now? Maybe. But the point is, we're starting to look at the spending authorities a little bit differently. There are now new questions about how far Congress can go in attaching strings. And even the court is starting to say there are limits. Uh, I may, well, no, I'm going to make this point, um, but I'm going to start speeding up a little bit. So another interesting thing having to do with spending authorities is uh, whether or not Congress can force the states to take an action that's costly to them and then not pay for it. It's called an unfunded mandate. And uh, uh, the Congress took it on themselves. This is part of that Republican revolution I, I described um, a, a couple minutes ago to say, we won't do that anymore. We're going to hold ourselves accountable. It was part of a movement toward uh, accountability and transparency and responsibility uh, throughout government and also in terms of uh, uh, that individuals have responsibilities. So they're saying, we won't do this anymore. But if you look at the terms of the unfunded mandate, it's we won't do it unless we decide we really want to do it. Because all that happens if there's a suspected unfunded mandate, that is if the GAO, the General Accounting Office, uh, runs, crunches the numbers and finds out, it figures out that it's going to cost the states a lot to do something that Congress is asking them to do, and Congress isn't giving them sufficient funds, there's a point of order, and then Congress can just repass the bill. That's it. So they can't do it unless they decide that they want to. Right? This is sounding a little bit like that four-prong test, right? 
But the thing is, what's interesting about it is that's been really effective. Now, there's no, this isn't constitutional, so there's definitely nothing that the, uh, there's, there's no constitutional juridical remedy here, right? Uh, and there doesn't appear to be anything within the functioning of Congress that can stop this. And as my favorite dead guy, James Madison, said, a sanction is essential to the idea of law as coercion is that to government, meaning if law doesn't have some consequence, it's not really law. Well, we seem to have a law without a consequence here, and yet it's effective. And so the question is, what's protecting the states and the cities from Congress here? And the answer is, since we're not relying now on the court, we're not relying on structure of government, the answer is the people. So here's some polling data from, uh, this is a, a Cato Institute poll working with YouGov, comparing data from 1973, remember that's back in the Nixon era, of um, new federalism, so at a time when people were talking about what the states could do, and then just recently, 2013, asking people about their support for centralization across a variety of domains. And what you see, the darker line being 2013, is a decline, apart from inexplicably education, um, there's a decline in every single domain in public support for centralized policy provision. The public, increasingly, is interested in what their states can do and is paying attention to state action and is willing to defend it. So those congressional members who might be tempted to repass an unfunded mandate would think twice because the public is starting now to care about whether or not Congress is overstepping its authorities and wants to see its states uh, be supported. This is Louis Brandeis, uh, who we love to trot out this beautiful quote he had in a dissent, uh, he was a Supreme Court justice, in a dissent over his frustration in poor Oklahoma's attempt to uh, regulate ice maker, ice machine manufacturers or something like that. I don't know. You know, this is back, look, look, pre-refrigerators, you had ice boxes and, you know, food went bad really fast. And so this was really important to people. Um, there was some kind of innovation that Oklahoma was trying. I don't know what it was. Um, and uh, the, the uh, um, court said that Oklahoma couldn't do this thing that they were trying to do. And Brandeis says, it is one of the happy, happy incidents of the federal system that a single courageous state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. Now, remember I talked about externalities, right? We can't think of it always being without risk. But there are things that states can experiment with that we can learn from. And so we already talked about same-sex marriage. We talked about that 2015 decision, and we saw changes through the states. There's, um, this is essentially showing in a much less appealing way, because it's not a map, um, the data that you saw earlier, uh, going from 1994, 1994 is when Hawaii started experimenting with, uh, for like an hour, I think it was possible for people to, uh, of the same sex to, to get a marriage license and then that was shut down. Um, but uh, the uh, changes first in red, banning same sex marriage and then in green, uh, permitting it. Well, as those states were experimenting, Oh, same thing. Uh, we were learning. We, the public, were learning. We were learning that this 
the sky wasn't going to fall if people who, you know, guys married guys and women married women. And it didn't change the quality of my love for my husband, right? Um, and so slowly, over that period from 1996 to 2014, we have people getting used to this idea. You can only get used to the idea if you've seen it and started to experience it. And so with this federal system and this ability of the states to experiment and innovate, we can learn. Sometimes we learn that there are very bad ideas. Right? Uh, but sometimes we learn, oh, maybe that's not so bad. And that's what's happening here. So now we have a majority of the population who supports same-sex marriage. We saw the same thing happen uh, in the 60s with interracial marriage. In possibly the best named case, <laughs> because Loving versus Virginia, these, they are the Lovings. That's their last name. Um, um, anyway, so they were, uh, uh, they went from, they lived in the state of Virginia, went to us where it was illegal for them as an interracial couple to be married, went to a state where it was not illegal, and uh, then once they came back to Virginia, they were rounded up and taken in. Um, and, bef and so the court in, in this case decided throughout the country that interracial uh, marriages were okay. But immediately prior, you see all the states in red. Virginia was not alone. Okay? But we'd had, and I'm sorry that I don't have polling data, but we have a time, all the gray states never bothered to regulate marriage. I mean, like, well, you know. So, uh, uh, the uh, green and yellow states uh, came on board um, uh, green before 1887, so a long time ago. Uh, yellow a little bit more recently, but red, it took the Supreme Court to overturn it. But what was happening is people were just getting used to this idea. It was a very strange idea that people of different colors would marry. But if then it starts happening, people get used to that idea. And that's something that the states experimenting could teach us. And then uh, whether or not marijuana should be legal, we're growing increasingly comfortable with that thought. So is this state experimentation leading toward that as well? Where we might see it uh, nationwide. So I want to close with just some implications of state experimentation, because if states are in this position of being able to set national policy, can we say something about what that policy might look like? Uh, and so one, one reason that why uh, states are in this position is Congress is so bound up with arguing with one another, there's like this power vacuum. Um, and so Heather Gerken, who's a law professor, talks about the uncooperative federalism where you know, states can shape policy just by saying no. And Bruce Katz, who's at Brookings, uh, uh, talks about the next federalism uh, where the cities are shaping policy. Um, so if they're shaping national policy, are there ideological implications? That is, I've been up to this point really emphasizing this diversity that can come from this experimentation. But there may be, this is a question that we ask as, as social scientists all the time, are there institutional reasons for thinking that there might be some kind of bias in the policy making that emerges? And the bias looks to be in the Republicans' favor. So first, why is that? Uh, Republicans are dominating state politics. So where um, there's a near 50-50 split in votes, or possibly a Democratic majority in votes, uh, uh, in the popular vote, there, uh, when it's aggregated at the state level, there is an advantage for the Republicans. Um, 
So as states become more powerful, it's Republican-favored policies that are more likely to emerge. Um, then uh, more than just the Republican electoral dominance, think, and this is something um, that I've just started to think about with one of my graduate students, thinking about other ways that states set policy and the influence of lobbying. So lobbying uh, is most traditionally, you know, where interest groups send representatives to speak to publicly elected officials to try to influence the legislation that emerges. And uh, gee, you can either lobby all the 50 states or you could go to Washington, D.C. Um, and you can imagine what most lobbyists choose to do, one office or 50 offices, right? Uh, uh, in fact, I was just uh, before the talk telling Jacob about a, a lobbying group that I um, spoke with last August, uh, actually the National League of Cities. They only lobby Washington, only. They, don't, they, they have uncoordinated activities across the states. But uh, uh, Republican-affiliated organizations have been very effective at seeing the advantages of lobbying within the state capitals. So they have what we're starting to call a 50-state solution, where, yeah, it seems inefficient, except as state influence is growing, it becomes increasingly wise to do this. Um, and then there's also the, a, an interesting advantage in terms of some of our states where legislators are term limited out. So they can't keep being reelected. There are 15 of our states that have term limitations. 12 of them are under, uh, that is both houses and the governor are held by Republicans. Uh, and another two of them, it's split with Republican uh, governors in at least one house held by Republicans. Okay, why does that matter? Well, when legislators are term limited out, it's difficult for traditional lobbyists because traditional lobbying is based on the construction of relationships. Right? But, and so with term limitations, you're just always having to meet someone new. But it advantages a very different kind of lobbying a kind that is about the provision of information, and especially if you can walk in with model legislation. Because these freshman legislators don't have a clue about how to write a bill. So if a lobbyist can come in and say, oh yeah, you know, and you care about this thing that I care about, and here's some idea, here's some language you could use. I don't have an explanation for why it's the case, but Republican-affiliated interest groups have been extremely effective at seeing this opportunity and taking model legislation in to uh, legislators, particularly in these term-limited states. So we might expect to see an advantage for uh, conservative policies coming out of the states and influencing, uh, um, influencing national policy making. Okay. So and we're starting to see it in a bunch of different kinds of policies that are coming up through the states. Okay, so a quick review, what did we do? Uh, I talked about this nature of federalism in terms of those boundaries of authority is changing and that the states and the cities are becoming more influential. Um, and they are helping to shape not only policy by ex uh, uh, being empowered, newly empowered in terms of authority, but they're even shaping the contours of individual rights. Uh, and that this evolutionary process is a product not just of the Supreme Court making decisions, but of agents pushing against their boundaries of authority, and different kinds of safeguards, including, very importantly, the public, reinterpreting what federalism means in the United States context. Uh, and so, and then possibly this uh, uh, apparent Republican advantage just in seeing 
this opportunity that's happening in the states and taking advantage of that much more quickly than the Democratic Party has done. So I'll just close with a quote from Bruce Katz. He's that um, Brookings uh, scholar. He says, uh, this is the next federaliz federalism. It's messy, uneven, chaotic, ground up, and quintessentially American. Thank you. Uh, as a heads up, we're going to have to get out of the room very promptly at a couple minutes to six o'clock because there was a, a mistake and overlapping reservations. Um, when we get out of the room, we will go through those doors and there will be a reception outside that we ask, uh, that we invite you to join us for. Um, we will have time for a couple of questions. And the first question at RGCS lectures is reserved for a member of the RGCS Student Fellowship. When you ask a question, please turn on the microphone in front of you. And then when you're done, please turn it off again. Patrick. I wonder, uh, you did speak quite a bit about sort of pieces of litigation. We've been hearing quite a lot about the role of state attorneys general in sort of more strategic litigation that seems to be becoming a more and more important tool. In this country, we tend to use, you know, advisory opinions to do that work, and in, it seems like direct litigation by state attorneys general is becoming one of the new tools. So I wonder if you could say something about how that connects to what you've talked about today. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the state attorneys general are, this is a fantastic office for pushing state uh, uh, advocating for authorities at the state has um, and it, in reinterpreting the Constitution in their favor. But what I will say is uh, that one thing that's um, interesting about sometimes what happens in these states, it's like a, you know, almost too much democracy in a sense when we have attorneys general elected, of course, independent of the uh, governors who are elected. So they're, they're not uh, appointed. Uh, they may not agree. And so, for example, with the Affordable Care Act, we have states where the uh, attorney general wrote a brief to the Supreme Court saying, oh, there's no way that the uh, Medicaid um, eligibility expansion should go through. This is terrible for the states. Meanwhile, the governor working full speed ahead to implement it. Uh, so, um, so we, you, the, the attorneys general certainly uh, uh, are, are interesting um, uh, in interests expressing the uh, importance of uh, recognizing um, state authorities, but it's also interesting to think about these conflicts that happen within states over that interpretation. Thank you uh, for the presentation, it's very informative. Um, so you mentioned the states as laboratories experimenting with policy, and one flip side that we often see with this is when states may feel hindered going out on their own. Um, in the Brandeis quotation, I think he mentioned a very courageous state. Yes, in some cases, he loved, uh, I love that word, courageous. Yeah. In some cases, it might not be enough. Um, yeah. And one example that always gets to my mind is when states are thinking about uh, putting together a carbon tax, but then are worried about that driving jobs out of the states. So I'm wondering kind of maybe how this, that phenomenon has evolved through history and also how federal institutions have evolved also to, to shape and kind of protect against that phenomena. So I'm so glad you brought up, and carbon tax is a, a terrific example of it. Okay, so um, this idea of will states, will single states be courageous and experiment? We saw Massachusetts as an early mover with same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage, they could afford to be an early mover because they could implement that policy and then the other states not moving doesn't affect them. In fact, it only positively affects them because remember all those tourism dollars. I swear, that really was something people were talking about. Tourism dollars to, flowing into Massachusetts. Um, but so they, they might not have seemed so courageous economically there. But you bring up carbon tax or other things that states might do to uh, is in particular with environmental regulation. 
So here we're moving into a very different kind of regulatory or policy environment where it's a problem that is what we call a, a collective action problem. Because if one state moves and all the rest of the states don't move, like with environmental regulation, then businesses who are affected by that environmental regulation in that state have an incentive, all else equal, to move out. Right? We also see this with welfare benefits. Right? If a state wants to be more generous, there's this, we call it a phenomenon of a race to the bottom. So there was, a, you know, at least theoretically, we are concerned in these policy environments where there are a lot of externalities that in these collective action, common pool resource kind of management issues where states won't be early aggressive movers in a way that will expose them. Oddly enough though, with environmental regulation, the states are moving ahead, some of them. There's a lot of diversity, right? But my colleague Barry Rabe at the University of Michigan has worked a lot on recognizing how it, during an era when the federal administration um, was not pursuing envir uh, environmental regulation particularly, uh, how the states were becoming increasingly aggressive. Um, and we do see some states moving forward with things like renewal, renewable energy portfolio standards saying, okay, a certain amount of energy that's generated within the state has to come from renewable sources. That's expensive but we're starting to see it. States, just like people, break the rules all the time of what we expected them to do. And so even in those circumstances, we do see courage. That was a good question. I have to press this. Okay, so my, my question has to do with how, how the, the model carries over across different institutional structures. Uh, so the United States, a lot of the examples, the example of uh, U.S. v. Lopez or the example of uh, uh, Agrafel, um, depend a lot on the, the fact that the United States has a separate criminal law at the federal level and the state level, and, uh, and states actually can control and differ in their criminalization of certain things. The marijuana legalization example is also along those lines. You can... Uh, something can be both legal and illegal under different jurisdictional authorities. When it comes to marriage, it's the same thing. Uh, under general police power, state control, the definition of the substance of marriage, and it's generally not being thought of as a, a federal uh, jurisdiction. The feds usually just take whatever definition is given to them. Uh, the Canadian case is, is quite different because there's unitary criminal law. Anything above a traffic offense is federal. Um, there is uh, the... the Provinces retain only jurisdiction over the solemnization of marriage. Alberta tried to contest the legalization of gay marriage and were told, no, you can only affect the solemnization but not the substance. And there's also the issue of the, federal, of the, of the court structure itself. The U.S. has a two-tier court structure, at least two tiers. Uh, in Canada, there's a unitary court structure. But I have heard, I haven't studied this directly, but I have heard that there is still a level of provincial competition that happens only at the prosecutorial discretion level. So if you think of the federal law as, uh, of the criminal law as, as offering discretion to prosecutors, then although crown prosecutors are part of a unified uh, uh, system, they are politically still controlled at the provincial level with the exception of some specific federal crimes. And some provinces seem to have instructed their crown prosecutors to prosecute certain things and not prosecute other things. Now, I'm just wondering how to map the theory of ground-up federalism to a very different federal distribution of powers and authorities, and whether the, the, the theory still holds or whether it's very dependent, as you said in the last quote that you posted, on a quintessentially American distribution of authority. That's a super rich question. Um, the yeah, exactly, because there's like wine waiting for us. So, uh, uh, so I'll give a very short answer and then maybe we can um, talk some more. But uh, even within 
Because al although there, there may be a, a unified court system for criminal law, of course your provinces are quite powerful in other domains, right? So, but um, the, uh, uh, imagine in the US, we had the equivalent of what you have, and we only had, say, the federal court system. Uh, but it's still, you know, we've got trial courts, and then we've got a, a, a circuit system of appellate courts, and then we've got the Supreme Court. So even there, you've got this modularization that's possible. And so it's uh, not at all uncommon. In fact, basically every time you see the Supreme Court taking on a decision, it's because there's differences that have emerged in interpretations of the Constitution in different uh, uh, appellate courts. And so the Supreme Court steps in to uh, address those differences and resolve them. When it doesn't step in, as it didn't in that Highland Park case, it uh, it may be because it says that this particular case is exactly what we would decide, except until it actually says that, it doesn't apply everywhere. Instead, what it's saying is, we're going to let diversity reign. So even in your system, you might get this diversity uh, that is tolerated for a while um, until there's learning that occurs. Oh. All right, we are going to quickly move out the side doors to the reception. I'll remind you that the RGCS debate on property ownership will be March 31st, the Jan P. Lynn inaugural lecture, Orlando Patterson, April 13th, uh, and please join me in thanking Professor Jenna Bednar.